the effective exploitation of his powers of abstraction must be regarded as one of the most vital activities of a competent programmer. In this connection, it might be worthwhile to point out that the purpose of abstracting is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. Of course, I have tried to find a fundamental cause that would prevent our abstraction mechanisms from being sufficiently effective. But no matter how hard I tried, I didn't find such a cause. And as a result, I tend to the assumption, up till now not disproved by experience, that by suitable application of our powers of abstraction, the intellectual effort needed to conceive or to understand a program needn't grow more than proportional to program length. But a byproduct of these investigations may be of much greater practical significance and is in fact the basis of my fourth argument. The byproduct was the identification of a number of patterns of abstraction that play a vital role in the whole process of composing programs. Enough is now known about these patterns of abstraction that you could devote a lecture to about each of them. What the familiarity and conscious knowledge of these patterns of abstraction imply dawned upon me when I realized that had they been common knowledge 15 years ago, the step from BNF to syntax-directed compilers, for instance, could have taken a few minutes instead of a few years. Therefore, I present our recent knowledge of vital abstraction patterns as the fourth argument. Now for the fifth argument. It has to do with the influence of the tool we are trying to use upon our own thinking habits. I observe a cultural tradition which in all probability has its roots in the Renaissance to ignore this influence, to regard the human mind as the supreme and autonomous master of its artifacts. But if I start to analyze the thinking habits of myself and of my fellow human beings, I come, whether I like it or not, to a completely different conclusion. To wit, that the tools we are trying to use and the language or notation we are using to express or record our thoughts are the major factors determining what we can think or express at all resource, they together give us a new collection of yardsticks for comparing the relative merits of various programming languages. The competent programmer is fully aware of the strictly limited size of his own skull. Therefore, he approaches the programming task in full humility. And among other things, he avoids clever tricks like the plague. In the case of a well-known conversational programming language, I have been told from various sides that as soon as a programming community is equipped with a terminal for it, a specific phenomenon occurs that even has a well-established name. It is called the one-liners. It takes one of two different forms. One programmer places a one-line program on the desk of another, and either he proudly tells what it does and adds the question, can you code this in less symbols, as if this were of any conceptual relevance, or he just asks, guess what it does? <laughs> From this observation, we must conclude that this language as a tool is an open invitation for clever tricks. And while exactly this may be the explanation for some of its appeal, to it to those who like to show how clever they are, I am sorry, 
But I must regard this as one of the most damning things that can be said about a programming language. Another lesson we should have learned from the recent past is that the development of richer or more powerful programming languages was a mistake in the sense that these Baroque monstrosities, these conglomerations of idiosyncrasies, are really unmanageable, both mechanically and mentally. I see a great future for a very systematic and very modest programming languages. When I say modest, I mean that, for instance, not only Algol 6 is four clause, but even Fortran's do loop may find themselves thrown out as being too Baroque. I have run a little programming experiment with really experienced volunteers, but something quite unintended and quite unexpected turned up. None of my volunteers found the obvious and most elegant solution. Upon closer analysis, this turned out to have a common source. Their notion of repetition was so tightly connected to the idea of an associated controlled variable to be stepped up that they were mentally blocked from seeing the obvious. Their solutions were less efficient, needlessly hard to understand, and it took them a very long time to find them. It was a revealing but also shocking experience for me. Finally, in one respect, one hopes that tomorrow's programming languages will differ greatly from what we are used to now. To a much greater extent than hitherto, they should invite us to reflect in the structure of what we write down all abstractions needed to cope conceptually with the complexity of what we are designing. So much for the adequacy of our future tools, which was the basis for my fifth argument. As an aside, I would like to insert a warning to those who identify the difficulty of, program, of the programming task with a struggle against the inadequacies of our current tools, because they might conclude that once our tools will be much more adequate, programming will no longer be a problem. Programming will remain very difficult because once we have freed ourselves from the circumstantial cumbersomenesses, we will find ourselves free to tackle the problems that are now well beyond our programming capacity. You can quarrel with my sixth argument, for it's not so easy to collect experimental evidence for its support, a fact that will not prevent me from believing in its validity. Up till now, I haven't mentioned the word hierarchy, but I think that it's fair to say that this is a key concept for all systems embodying a nicely factored solution. I could even go one step further and make an article of faith out of it, to wit, that the only problems we can really solve in a satisfactory manner are those that finally admit a nicely factored solution. At first sight, this view of human limitations may strike you as a rather depressing view of our predicament. But I don't feel it that way. On the contrary, the best way to learn to live with our limitations is to know them. 